Hello, and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Laura. I'm Kate. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. Today, we bring you Bookshelf, an episode dedicated to the books we're each reading outside of book club, the ones we get to pick and choose for ourselves. It's the beginning of a new year, and we're excited about all the books we're going to be reading in 2023. But first, what about the ones we curled up with over the winter holiday? The books that kept us company on cold winter nights, or in my case, lucky me, on the beaches of the Baja. Well, on my list, I have A Place of Greater Safety, Hilary Mantel's immersive novel about the French Revolution, The Ginger Tree by Oswald Wind, a backless gem first published in 1977, and The Goblin Emperor, Catherine Addison's blend of court intrigue, goblins, and airships. Well, for me, also on the fantasy ticket, it's Babel, R.F. Quang's fantasy epic set in 19th century England, Our Wives Under the Sea, the critically acclaimed novel from British writer Julia Armfield, part bruisingly tender love story, part nerve-clanging submarine thriller, and Either Or from Elif Batterman, the continuing adventures of her protagonist Céline, now in her junior year at Harvard, that has been described as a second year of love, sex and books. That's all coming up here on the Book Club Review. I had a wonderful reading holiday. I got through a lot of books. I found a lot of time and kind of mental bandwidth to sink into different novels. What about you, Kate? Yeah, actually, I mean, the run up to Christmas was so crazy. Just so much going on as it is every year. But then after that, in that lovely period, once all the Christmas stuff is set up and running and you don't have to make things anymore or do things anymore, that was so great. And I also actually got quite a bit of reading done. So, yeah. And of the three, which one do you want to start with? I'm quite curious about Babel. Well, Babel? Babel. Yeah. I mean, I had an interesting Phil, who is, as many listeners will know, our much loved regular podcast guest. Phil also read this book and we had quite a funny, quite intense WhatsApp chat afterwards, which normally, because Phil is primarily your friend, he's in your book club. Generally speaking, any interactions I have with Phil are usually on a group chat that you're a part of. But this felt like it needed to be a sideline because I think we're both very curious to know if you read this book, what you make of it. And we didn't want to potentially like spoil your your, your future thoughts on it. First of all, what is it about? It's set in an Oxford college and there is this young man called Robin who we first meet when he is taken from his home in Canton in China. His mother has died. There's been a plague. It's, It's sort of like early Victorian era. So there's been this plague sweeping through the city. His mother has died. And then this mysterious benefactor, Professor Lovell, has come in and says to Robin, I can give you the chance of another life in another country if you're willing to come with me. And Robin doesn't have anything to lose. And so he says yes. And it turns out that the professor is interested in him because he has been brought up speaking his native Cantonese, but also English. And you learn that there was a mysterious woman he knew as Miss Betty, who'd always been present, who taught him English. And you start to understand that Robin's very existence has been quite carefully contrived. And so he is fluently bilingual. And it turns out that this is a very valuable skill because in this world, which is like our world, but not quite, in this world, silver has magical properties. And these magical properties can be activated by people who can speak different languages. R.F. Quang, the author, is herself an academic. She's currently, I think, doing a PhD in languages at Oxford. And so one of the real pleasures of this novel is that there is a lot of detail around the idea of linguistics and languages and translation and meanings of words. And there's this idea about matched pairs. So you can have a word that has a meaning in one language. And if you can find a word in another language that somehow corresponds to that meaning, in that sort of slight dissonance between the two, because there's never a perfect match, that's when this magic is activated. So there's an interesting idea about a magic system. And from an almost like historical novel point of view, it's all really beautifully evoked. It's set in Oxford. You feel like you're there. These colleges seem very real and vivid. It's almost got that slight sense that's so delightful about Philip Pullman's novels, the way that he evokes Oxford. It's got that same vivid immersive sense to it that's really enjoyable 
And Robin goes to study at Oxford. He understands he's going to be in this program where he's going to be continuing his language studies with the ultimate purpose that he will become one of these people who were able to manipulate and work silver. And he makes some friends, so that ends up being this little group of four of them who are going through this program together. For the middle section of the book, it's really very much about their day-to-day life, learning as students in Oxford. And then towards the end, you get a whole third act, which is to do with their growing realisation and understanding about the inequalities of the world that they have been existing in. So it starts to dawn on them that all of the wealth of these Oxford colleges and indeed England has come from colonial exploitation. And as people who have come from countries outside of the UK, they're very keenly aware of this and sensitive to this. And so there is a sort of huge political subtext to this novel that's actually really interesting. And it's strange then, you would think, with this sort of mix of elements and good writing, and it's all underpinned by this incredibly interesting knowledge of linguistics and the world of languages. You would just think it would be so great. And somehow, for me, it just didn't quite work. And one of the main problems I have with it is that there's just not enough fantasy in it. So you've got this idea, (laughs) this great idea of this silver and this magic system, but actually it's hardly ever invoked. I think Robin himself only actually activates silver, I think maybe twice in the whole book. It's just not enough of it. It's just not there. And then if it is almost then the real world side of it, you know, the historical novel part of it, that's where it fell down for Phil because he said there are all of these historical inconsistencies and inaccuracies that really jerked him out of the moment. And then this political lens through which he's viewing the world is also quite problematic because it feels like a very 21st century take on attitudes that we know were very different back in this particular time period. And so there's this real disconnect and it just feels odd. It reads oddly. Phil said, I went in expecting lots on empire and the opium wars and I thought the setup of translation as the engine of industrialization stroke empire was perfect. But those characters, their outlook and the entire paradigm that drove the narrative was that of woke 2020 Twitter users. It felt so painfully anachronistic and out of place. So it's an unsettling experience and it's too long. It's too baggy. The characters aren't really that well developed. So she does that thing where she's not afraid to kill one off if she needs to. But you don't really care. You're not that invested (laughs) in any of them. And I think that's, again, that's the fault of the character building and... And so it's a tricky one. It seemed so promising. It felt so exciting. But actually, ultimately, it's a long old book and it didn't really deliver. And I think Phil felt the same way. We were very interested to know what you would think. And I mean, this book, we should say, has been an absolute bestseller. It has been hugely popular. People absolutely love it. And R.F. Quang is such an interesting person. She's such an interesting writer. She's so young. She's sort of in her sort of early 20s, I think. And she's clearly brilliant. It feels very much like she's just on the beginning of her journey, really, as an author. And already she's churning out books that are this good. What's she going to do as she sort of matures and develops, I suppose? That's what it felt like to me. I got a teaser of that chat that you and Phil had about this book on WhatsApp, I guess, before you went into your own WhatsApp (laughs) chat. And so I was slightly put off. But your description actually does intrigue me. And, you know, it's been compared to The Secret History and Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. And your description triggered certainly the Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell connection. So you never know. Maybe I'll like it simply to be contrary. Well, you know why that is? It's because she does a really lovely thing with the footnotes, which also is a very striking feature of Jonathan Strange, where there's almost a whole side text going on in these little asides at the bottom of the page. What was frustrating about that for me was just almost it really not R. of Quang's fault at all. It was a kind of typographic issue to do with the fact that the <laughs> asterisks in the text that tell you where the footnotes are are so microscopically small that I genuinely often couldn't find them. And so I would read the footnote and then I'd be looking back through the text to see if I could figure out, well, where is the reference? Which drove me absolutely nuts. I mean, that was really just a kind of strange, basic thing. And I don't think I'm so very old, you know, my eyes failing to the extent that I can't see asterisks. They were really tiny. And it only mattered because the footnotes are such a key part of this book and this text. So that was a strange publishing fail for me there. Only a book designer would flag that. (laughs) We also felt 
that the publisher's Harper Voyager had missed the gift of an opportunity to do silver spreadges. And <laughs> maybe it's still to come. It's a beautiful hardback. It's got absolutely amazing cover art. But yeah, we were like, oh man, imagine if it had had silver spreadges. <laughs> well, that is an interesting segue into The Ginger Tree. You would think those are very different novels, and they are. But the connection is that in The Ginger Tree, we have a young protagonist, 20-year-old Mary Mackenzie, who's grown up in Edinburgh, setting sail for China, where she will marry a military attache in Peking. So it's 1903. It's written in letters. I don't always love a letter-based novel. I'm not sure about you. I think it works so well here. Just taking a step back, my friend Caitlin, who's in book club with me, sent me a message and said, you need to read The Ginger Tree by Oswald Wind. It's this backless gem. I think you'll really love it. I know you don't love novels that span someone's entire life, which generally is true, but I think you'll really enjoy it. And I did. It's the novel of Mary, as I say, who is a wonderful protagonist. She's young. She's curious. She has been brought up in Puritan Edinburgh to think a certain way. But as soon as she sets sail on that ship, she's ready to change and she's ready to learn and to think about things differently in a way that is a testament to her character. This is on the back, so I don't think it spoils too much. But her planned life begins to unravel in Peking. The marriage is not particularly happy. And she has an adulterous affair with a Japanese military. I also want to say attache, like her husband. And she gets pregnant. And so the novel moves on from there. And although she begins this new life in Peking, she is brought over to Japan because she's thrown out of the European community. And she's supposed to have been sent back to England. That's what her husband has planned for her. But with the help of this Japanese military attache, I should say he's a nobleman in Japan, she is able to move to Japan and then begins to carve out her own life there. It's really great. I don't know how much I should say beyond that. It does cover 40 years as the British Empire, pleasingly, I think, begins to fall apart a little bit. And those two world wars, the Tokyo earthquake of 1923. There's some beautiful imagery in here, I have to say. And it's possibly a testament to the quality of this book and its portrait of Japan, which I know you love, Kate, and have been to many times. There's a quote on the back from the Japan Times, and it says, one of the few contemporary novels to show Japan as it was and as it is. I should say that it was written in 1977. It's written by a man who himself was born in Tokyo in 1913, so later although one imagines his parents were contemporaries with our protagonist. And he grew up in Japan. Scottish parents were running a mission there, fluent in both English and Japanese. So he has a real close understanding of the differences in those cultures. And I think that comes through in the novel. Also just a remarkable portrait of a young woman from the male perspective, especially for the late 70s. There's just a very subtle thread about the female experience, even down to you know, your monthly period that you wouldn't necessarily look for in a novel by a man. I think it's really great. I was so pleased that Caitlin sent it my way. And yeah, I was on holiday, as I said in the introduction. And so I'll always remember this book, Red on the Beach in Mexico, after I put my daughter to sleep. I think I'll be very fond of it for a long time. It feels very obscure. I'd never heard of it. I had mm. to look it up. I didn't know anything about it. I'm curious. I mean, how did Caitlin come across it? I don't know. I'll have no. to follow up and ask her. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm excited. I feel like we could have uncovered something that no one knows about. <laughs> well, Caitlin might have uncovered. Maybe. It would be great for it to have a second life. I couldn't get a copy of it. When Caitlin recommended it, there was no copies in the Vancouver Public Library. There was no easy way to get it secondhand online, I should say, from a Canadian distributor. And there's this amazing used bookshop called McLeod's Books in downtown Vancouver. The owner is this slightly crotchety old man. You know, it's one of those used bookstores where there's just stacks of books everywhere. And there is order to the chaos, but still, it just feels slightly overwhelming. I went to go find it in the main stacks. It wasn't there. So I went to him and said, hey, do you have this book? And he said, yes, I think I do. I think it's downstairs. And he went downstairs, I think, into his archives and pulled it up. So I was so excited because Caitlin had thought she might have to send me her copy. <laughs> Just a quick aside from future me to let you listeners know that Laura did follow up with Caitlin to track down the recommendation and it turned out to have come from her Daunt Books subscription. 
where they send you a book a month according to your preferences. Caitlin had asked for under-the-radar 20th century novels, and this is one of the ones that they sent. She also said it took her two years to actually get around to picking it up due to the understated brown cover with a fish on it. Just goes to show, we shouldn't judge books by their covers. What's next? Well, from an obscure book that's hard to get hold of to um, a critically acclaimed book that's quite easy to get hold of, (laughs) Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. Lots of people were really impressed by her short story collection, Salt Slow, which I knew about. I knew that was good. And then I remember people, this is a book where, you know, it felt like people who'd read it were just raving about it. And so I was a little bit intrigued and I had it on my sort of long request list at the London Library. It's nice I idly put things down there when I hear about them and some months later they turn up just because the thing about that library is that when people borrow books they basically there's no kind of well it's like it's supposed to be three months I think but there's not really any limit on how long you can keep them. Do you remember we once talked about on the podcast I had tried to order a book called Slipstream by Elizabeth Jane Howard and I had to wait about a year before it came and then I (laughs) kept it myself for about six months. (laughs) Anyway so it's just kind of a fun thing though because it means that I order these things I just put them in my queue and then they turn up and I've just forgotten all about them. And so this book arrived and it has the most amazing cover. It's this incredible image of a woman as if seen almost through a shower door. There's water trickling down. Even the cover image is really haunting and atmospheric. And that very much mirrors the novel inside. It tells the story of two women. They're married. And one of them is um, some kind of scientist, a marine biologist or oceanographer. And she is sent off in a submarine that's designed to go very, very deep in the ocean on a research mission. So you get her story of a mission that effectively goes wrong. The submarine ends up falling into a trench to some incredible depth. And they are effectively then marooned there in this tiny tin can at the bottom of the ocean in the dark. But they have power and they have supplies and they have oxygen. And and so they're really just sort of stuck there. So that's what's going on on one level. And then on the other, you get the the wife's story. There's a time disconnect. So the wife is recounting the story of when her partner came back. Their names are Miri and Leah. And Leah is the oceanographer and Miri is the one that stays at home. And so Miri's story we hear when Leah has come back from this trip. So you know from the very beginning that she survives and she comes back. But what has happened to her? Because she has come back changed. She's not the person that she once was. What happened down there? and what's going on with her now. So it's really propulsive because you have all these questions trying to be resolved, both in the story of what happened down there at the bottom of the ocean and also what's happening now between them, what's happening with their relationship. And it weaves in a lot of really wonderful everyday details about any long-standing relationship between a couple. I felt there was a lot of really beautifully observed stuff to do with love, but also tension and strains and where things can be difficult and maybe how couples work things out. There was a lovely element of that and tenderness. It's a very tender book, I thought. But at the same time, she's kind of playing around with, if it's any genre, it's horror. Something horrible is going on. And so it's suffused with dread. So it's a really, really complex mix, I think, of emotions and things going on. As I say, very propulsive, very atmospheric. I, it turns out, don't really like the idea of being confined in a submarine (laughs) under the ocean. It never really came up before. I, you know, I've watched The Hunt for an October and I was fine. But that was a much bigger boat. This is tiny. and, And so I found that really uncomfortable. I didn't really enjoy reading about that. It really kind of, it was hard to go to sleep after reading that. I have a funny anecdote related to that. Mm -hmm. At the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria, they had, when I was a child, this immersive experience where you were taken through the deep sea and you were meant to believe as you were in different elevators or spaces that you were in a submarine. I think I must have been about six or seven. Like I was old enough to understand reality versus, you know, pretend. Mm. And yet there was one sequence where you lose electricity in this tiny submarine and there, it looks like water is going to come through. And oh I, I was there, like I, I was with my parents, but in my mind, we were in that submarine. Like it was so immersive. And yeah. I remember crying oh. and then, but then being really embarrassed when I was shocked out of it, that of course this has all been pretend. So Kate, I understand. I had this well, like, formative also, childhood know, experience. Exactly. And I'm haunted by, remember watching the Poseidon Adventure with my sister. Have you ever seen that film? No. 
awful. It's like a cruise liner gets, it's a disaster movie. Cruise liner gets kind of, I don't know what happens, crashes into a, a rock or something. Anyway, it ends up sinking. And then there's just this awful thing about just all these people dying horribly and then our main people trying to get out. And are they going to make it? You know, and you're really rooting for them. And that's what pulls you through it. But at the same time, it's absolutely terrifying. And it's so sad. <laughs> yeah. And we watched got- that at a really tender age because I seem to remember, you know, I feel like they were constantly playing it. It was just always on. Anyway, so, yeah, it was it was an interesting. But I think Julia Armfield knows this. I think she wanted it to be an uncomfortable read. I think one of the things that's really enjoyable about it is her sense of control and it's just a really intriguing book. When I finished it, I thought, oh, that would be so great for book club. It felt like one where there's so many layers to it. It's not that long a read, so much to discuss. And I read it a few weeks ago and it has really stayed with me in a really nice way since sometimes you just read things and they steal into your soul a little bit, don't they? And they sort of stay there. And this is absolutely one of those. So from a short book, tell me about <laughs> A Place of Greater Safety, because that's the opposite, isn't it? Oh, so A Place of Greater Safety is by Booker Prize winner Hilary Mantel, esteemed author of Wolf Hall, Bring Up the Bodies, and I always forget the name of the third one. The Mirror and the Light. The Mirror and the Light. She wrote this one in 1992, so a good 15 years before Wolf Hall came out, and earlier in her writing career. I understand it was her first historical novel, and it very much shows where she will end up with Wolf Hall. It's the French Revolution, of which, apparently, I know nothing about. (laughs) Even the fact that we think of the French Revolution as a moment in time, and I think it was like a decade or two, like it just kept going on and on and on. I know about it from Les Miserables. Is that that helpful? I, I Which I saw actually, three times. Okay, well, you might have a better memory of Les Miserables. And I really want to watch Les Miserables again, having almost finished this book. Because the main players in this book don't really mean much to me, but they are the central figures of the revolution. So there's three key figures. Camille Desmoulins, who is a bit of a dreamy playboy intellectual who is an incredible writer. And so he is sort of the voice of the revolution. And then there's his friend, Jean-Jacques Danton. I wonder if you recognize that name, Danton, because I feel like it's all over Paris. Yes, I do. That was exactly what I was thinking. (laughs) And he's the thug of the revolution. I should say they're all lawyers. He's not the one who died in the bath, is he? Who's that? Is that Matt? I don't know. I don't know. He's, I don't know. I don't know yet, Kate. Don't tell me these things. Oh, have you not finished it? (laughs) (laughs) No, I'll get to that. So Danton's sort of the thug of the revolution. I mean, he's the one who's, I mean, he's much more than that, but he's this incredible presence, manifestation of the revolution. And he, through sheer force of will and charisma to a certain extent, is kind of pulling the revolution forward and rallying the Parisians to arms. There's then Robespierre. And I knew that name, Francois de Robespierre, who is sort of pure of heart. Of all of them, he's the only one who is not really making a ton of money off the back of the revolution. And I feel like there's Marat. Marat does show up. Of course he would. And they're very dismissive of him, despite him having a certain influence and being very much a driver of the revolution. But they're always like, oh, he looks so sickly. Well, and there's a very famous painting, which is why I know that, because visual person, that's just the image that stayed with me. But um, Jacques-Louis David painted him in the bath, dead, with a book. (laughs) That's how I want to go. Oh, no, it's a letter. I think it's a letter. Okay. But reading in the bath, anyway. I wonder if we'll get there. Was he old or was he young? No, quite young. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, there's a bit of foreshadowing for me. What would I say about this novel? It's thrilling. It's exciting. I turned to it after reading Eight Months on Gaza Street. And listeners and you, Kate, will recall that my whole book club loved that book and just said, why do we read anyone other than Hilary Mantel? And you know I love historical fiction. Now, all that said, it is a bit of a slog. And you know how in Wolf Hall, sometimes it's difficult to know who's talking, what's happening, and you're a bit lost. This is more of that, because I think Mm. it's a little bit less evolved. She's really trying to show the chaos of the revolution and what we now see as a set of linear events, but actually how it was created through manipulation and pamphlets and riots and, you know, strategic violence. I'm about 600 pages through. I kept telling people that this novel was 1,200 pages because I was reading it on Kindle. And I was like, gosh, I'm just really not getting through this one. Mm. I was like, well, it's very, very long. 
And then finally, I bought myself a print copy at that same McLeod's Books. And it's actually only 700 pages long, so I'm feeling a little sheepish that I haven't got further. It's great. It's, it's quite something. And I will go back to it because I love these characters and I love the writing. But I've had to slip in other books for my own sanity and I think mm. to keep it fresh. Well, I'm impressed that you were reading that on the beaches of Baja. <laughs> on my Kindle, it must be said. I didn't take the thick one. Do you want to know what I was really reading on the beaches of the Baja? Yeah. <laughs> if that's a fair segue. So what did I read after I had finished the ginger tree and certainly before I wanted to dive back into a place of greater safety? Well, that would be The Goblin Emperor by Catherine Addison. And although we didn't say it in the introduction, I also then went on and read The Witness for the Dead and The Grief of Stones on my Kindle. Just was like, yep, this is a great world to be in. So this is three books in a series? Sort of. So the first novel, The Goblin Emperor, is actually kind of standalone, though all three books are set in the same world. And I found this one for myself in Elliott Bay Bookshop in Seattle, which I swear is one of the best bookshops in the world. Like You must come to the West Coast, to Seattle, so that we can browse. And one of the things that makes it so outstanding is it's just packed full of booksellers who love to read and who have amazing judgment. And so I always beeline to the fantasy section there because I love fantasy, but most of it's drivel. And I can never Mm. find good fantasy except at Elliott Bay because they put out those little cards and recommendations and their recommendations are always right. So this is a novel that went under my radar, but when it was published in 2014, did scoop up a host of awards. But what really caught my eye on the back cover was this quote which says, a remarkably hopeful story of a single decent person doing his best in a difficult situation. Remarkably compelling and fascinating. And I don't know about you, but I'm really into reading about decent people at the moment when there's so many awful people out there. And there's this current obsession, I think, particularly in television, but of focusing on awful people doing awful things. I was like, no, I want a decent person trying to Mm. do the right thing. And in this case, that is the youngest son of the emperor who is half elf and half goblin. And his father, who was the emperor of the imperial court, married his goblin mother for... I always laugh because I think some listeners are like, goblins, ridiculous. You know, you have to put aside your skepticism. (laughs) You can imagine, though, that no one wants or would ever think that the youngest son of the emperor would inherit the, I want to say throne, is that the right word? But his father, the emperor, who he has never met, he's been sent off into exile. He's been brought up actually in penury with an abusive carer um, and uh, and been forgotten for all intents and purposes after his mother dies um, at a young age. But his father is killed in an airship disaster along with all of his heirs. And so this young, this, I want to say young man, but, you know, young male goblin comes back to court and takes up the position of emperor and really takes it for himself. And we talked in our last episode a lot about cozy crime. I think I want a slightly new genre, which is like cozy fantasy, Mm. because this has a lot of intrigue. It has, does it have a bit of violence? Maybe. But just generally, it was quite cozy and pleasant while being fully entertaining with enough drama to pull me forward. And so when I finished this, which I would recommend, I then read two other spinoff books, which is actually like cozy fantasy crime. Because there's a character in The Goblin Emperor who is a witness for the dead. The witness for the dead are priests, but they're priests who can lay their hand on the dead and hear some of their memories, depending on the state of the dead person. Mm-hmm. Well, how decomposed they are. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, or, or indeed, whether they're ashes. And so they're often called on in like a detective role to share where something might have been hidden and now has been lost or to clarify the terms of a will. This witness for the dead from the Goblin Emperor becomes the central character in these two other spin-off novels. And these are even more cozy and slow moving. And he just kind of walks around town talking to people, trying to solve crime. There's no high stakes. Everyone's quite kind to each other. He himself is a bit traumatized from past events. So people are just trying to look out for him. It all sounds very dull. And I do think it might be dull. Will I fall in love with him? Because if I do, that might pull me through it. Maybe. 
You know, I would love to know if anyone has read these books. Sometimes you're just so charmed by characters, right? Mm. You're really warm to them. Mm -hmm. And you feel like you're in kind of a safe place where you're not going to be surprised, but you're going to be rewarded. You're going to see how this person builds relationships, makes friendships. That was this world. And it was a great place to be on my mm. holiday. I'm almost more intrigued by those than I am by the first one. Although slightly traumatizing echoes of the Thursday Murder Club coming back to me. I mean, you know, are they better <laughs> than that? I think so. I wouldn't okay. say the writing is exceptional, but I would say the writing's innocuous, like in the sense that it just kept me going and I never was kind of yeah. shocked out of it by the caliber of the writing. You're selling it to me less now. Innocuous writing is not really going to... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Quote from Laura Potter on the back. Innocuous. <laughs> well... <laughs> Will well, not offend. Oh, but Kate, but you think about it. There's so many fantasy novels that are good-ish, but the writing, you really have to overlook the writing. That's not the case mm. here. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm definitely going to look it up. I can't promise I'll do more than that. Okay, my last one is, again, a bit of a buzz book. Lots of people are very excited about this. Elif Batterman had a new book out at the end of last year called Either Or. The reason for the anticipation was that so many people really loved her first novel, The Idiot. And she also wrote a non-fiction kind of memoir called The Possessed, which was about her life as a student and then traveling and, and different languages that she speaks and learning Russian and exploring that. And, and she's hilarious. She's just one of these people who is very funny and super bright. I found The Possessed and such an engaging read. I absolutely loved it. I didn't enjoy The Idiot so much, but that's, I think, because I had so enjoyed this memoir that when it suddenly then became sort of fictional, I found that a little bit frustrating. But this character, Celine, is in The Idiot. She's in her freshman year at Harvard. And you're following her as she kind of gets to grips with being there and her studies and she's studying languages and so, yeah, and Linking Back to Babel, actually, there's a lot of stuff about linguistics and word meanings. It's all quite interesting. It's also very funny. Lots of brilliant observational details about being in Harvard and what that's like. And then she does a bit of traveling, too. And there's this unrequited love affair. She's quite young, Celine, and she falls in love with this guy, Ivan, who, as a reader, you know, it's like, you know, he's just not into her in the same way that she's <laughs> into him. But he's older and you can kind of see what the attraction is. He's very brilliant in his own way. I think he's a mathematician. And it's very relatable. She's a very relatable character. And, and so you root for her in either or it picks up in her sophomore year. So we're just back into Celine and her life at Harvard. She's a bit more confident now of who she is. But at the same time, she's really suffering over this one-sided relationship that she oh, just no, cannot she let go. She kicked him to the curb. Bummer. Exactly. <laughs> and it's full of really beautifully observed period details, like the early days of the internet where you could, it was all done through, you would type commands into your computer and you could ping people. I remember this. You could type in a command and you could see where someone was if they were online. You have to be a certain age. <laughs> it was just this kind of delighted recognition. It's like, oh, yeah, it was like that in the early sort of dawning days of the internet. Because I feel like universities was where it really almost, it got used a lot maybe before almost it broadened out to the general population. I can remember having brilliant chats with my husband. We were both Aww. at Exeter University. And I remember he would be in one section of the campus and I would be on another. We were both using, you know, you had to go to a computer room. We didn't all have laptops. And if you knew they were there, you could split the screen and then you could have this text chat with one person typing on one half and the other person typing on the other half. And they were the funniest, best conversations. And there's a little bit of that in this book, which I was just so happy to read. Anyway, so it's just got lots that's really brilliant about it. It's really enjoyable. At the same time, there is this philosophical level to it that's also quite interesting. The title comes from a short work by Kierkegaard. Is that how you say it? Either or, which is uh, a book where he is considering how to live a life and considering the merits of what he calls the aesthetic life, which is a life where it's all about books and art and sensual pleasures. And then that juxtaposed against the idea of an ethical life, a life of marriage and duty and responsibility. Mm. And what are the benefits and drawbacks of each? And, you know, are we screwed either way? Does it matter if we choose one or the other? You know, is it going to affect how we turn out? She's wrestling with a lot of this and the sort of philosophical musings is a really interesting thread. I found a lot of it was a bit over my head, but what I liked about it is that that didn't really matter. I liked that it was there. I didn't worry too much about it. There's also quite a lot of sex in this book. And funnily <laughs> enough, I didn't 
enjoy that so much. I felt like I kind of understood why it was there. I think it is a really important part of any young woman's experience. It just feels fairly inevitable that, you know, you're going to end up having sex with a lot of young, inexperienced men, and it's probably going to be terrible. (laughs) I I think it just made me sad in a way how sort of, it was a sort of vulnerable side to her. And I almost just felt, yeah, it just, I felt, you know, it's such a shame it has to be this way and it shouldn't be this way. And Mm. I hope things are better now, maybe perhaps than they were then. I did think the, you know, talking about historical accuracy and things feeling right, what she did brilliantly was that she did not passed back with this 21st century sensibility about consent and what's appropriate and what's not you know she didn't then project that back onto this particular time period what she did really cleverly was she very much put her character and her situation in that moment in time and so you as a reader are aware that things have moved on but Celine isn't you know she's very Mm. much in that time and that place it was just handled really brilliantly I really loved it. I got to the end and there's quite an open ending where it just stops just as you think she's heading off on a travel adventure into Russia. And I was really like, oh, I was reading on the Kindle. I hadn't known I was getting that close to the end. And so then you think, oh, is she going to write another one? Be so great if she did then the junior and the senior years. That would be really fun. But I don't know if she's going to write those books. But yeah, no, I really recommend this. It was great. I really enjoyed it. It was good. I loved The Idiot. I have a very distinct memory. And I thought we talked about this book on the pod, but I can't find it in any of our past episodes. It doesn't pop like up. Are you right? I feel like we may have two. I mean, I thought this was better than The Idiot. It's definitely more of the same, and that's great. But yeah. it, it felt a little bit more assured, a little bit more tightly controlled, I suppose. And also more, it's almost like the author's challenging herself. You sense that as you're reading it. It really feels like an ongoing philosophical investigation into what is life all about? Mm-hmm. Why are we even here? What are we doing with our time? But set in this almost like quite high-end elite particular subsection of American society, which is very interesting to sort of be a fly on the wall in. I loved The Idiot. And I think I read most, I mean, it's a long book, but I read a lot of it in one lazy afternoon back in the day when I didn't have a small child. But I haven't picked this one up yet. You've convinced me that I should. I think you'd really enjoy it. Yeah. I think it's a pretty safe bet for you. So those are the books we've read recently. What are we going to read next? I have some books I was just going to reference. Ooh, yeah, show me your stack. Well, I have already started The Leopard by Giuseppe di Lampedusa. Oh, I love The Leopard. Did you? You've read it. And you know, it's one of Phil's favorite books. We did it for book club the longest time ago. Mm. That's where I discovered it. And I've read it again since then. It's such a great book. Yes. So I always am a little bit confused about this because I think of it as a classic. And it is... But it was written in the 1960s, and it's about the 1860s. And it's told from the perspective of the Prince of Selina. His name is Don Fabrizio. And it's his view of this period of great historic change. It's set in Sicily. You feel the heat. I have been to Sicily. I don't know if that helps, but certainly makes me feel very warmly towards this book from the start. I'm finding it a little bit hard to get into at bedtime. You know, mm. I, I started reading it on a holiday and I was like, yes, this is the I, book for so that's me. The thing. I think that's the thing. I think that's a summer book. It's a mm. summer read. Mm. And you almost might need to put it aside till well, maybe. You know, the summer months because it's perfect. That might be good advice. I also was given a copy of The Whalebone Theatre by Joanna Quinn. Oh, someone was just telling me about this book the other day. And I realized that my whole preconception of it was so wrong. It's like it's nothing to do with what I just looking at the cover and the title had thought it was to do with. I thought it was some kind of seafaring yarn. Like no. (laughs) Well, listeners might recall that I recommended this as a summer read before I'd actually read it. I'd read the first 10% on Kindle and was hooked, but didn't get going, didn't keep going. And I thought it was kind of like a stately home novel, but that's just the first 10%. And then our protagonist grows up and she becomes a spy, I think, in World War II. And I think that's the bulk of the novel. Mm. Anywho, I'm excited to get into that. And then I have The Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse, which is, in fact, another fantasy novel. (laughs) And it's inspired by the civilizations of the pre-Columbian Americas. And it's supposed to be a wonderful take on fantasy science fiction horror from an indigenous perspective so that'll be great yeah i pulled these out of my i forgot i had these because i got them for christmas then i went on holiday and i pulled them out from under my bed and i thought oh yes great they're next (laughs) i am reading brother of the more famous jack by barbara trapedo which i'm reading for emily's walking book club which i'm going to on sunday this is our friend emily 
who runs this amazing walking book group which meets once a month on Hampstead Heath here in London and you get to walk around and Emily periodically stops everybody and gets everyone thinking about a particular theme and then off you go again she puts you in little twos and threes and it's a really lovely way of walking and talking about books she also is very thoughtful about how she picks them she used to work in book selling she used to run a branch of Daunts and so she's always on the lookout for those books that make for good rich discussion books and yeah I knew I was free for this one so I had put it in my diary and then realized it was coming up and I'm still free so I thought okay great I have this book I've been meaning to read it for a long time I will read it and go it's a funny sort of um, almost actually not a million miles away from the Elif Batterman it feels like a coming of age story about a young woman who ends up encountering or getting involved with this uh, very charismatic family the dad is her professor at university there's his wife there are like six children there are lots of children there's another figure who's a slightly louche gay man who's the point of connection brings her into that group in the first place it's all a bit strange the social dynamics of it I can't quite work out yet but it's quite funny and very intriguing really I just like where is this going I just don't know so I'm enjoying it so far I'm about a third of the way through and the writing is really good so yeah I think that'll be a fun one that's what's keeping me turning the pages at the minute that sounds really great I want to read that too the books are stacking up <laughs> It's just so many books. There's so many books. <laughs> well, listeners, let us know what you've been reading. And if you have any thoughts on the books discussed today, we always love to hear from you. We do. I get many of my best recommendations from listeners messaging us. So yes, please do. We really love to get them. That's nearly it for this episode. Books mentioned were Babel by R.F. Quang, The Ginger Tree by Oswald Wind, Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield, a Place of Greater Safety by Hilary Mantel, Either Or by Elif Batuman, and we also mentioned her previous books, The Dispossessed and The Idiot, and The Goblin Emperor, The Witness for the Dead, and The Grief of Stones by Catherine Addison. And in our current reads pile, we have The Leopard by Giuseppe de Lampedusa, The Whalebone Theatre by Joanna Quinn, and Brother of the More Famous Jack by Barbara Trapido. Coming up on the pod, we're going to be joined by Chrissy Ryan and her team at our favourite bookshop, Book Bar to look into the future and line up our most anticipated releases of 2023. If you want to know the books to watch out for in the coming months, there's no place better to start. We've also got a book club episode in the works, focusing on The Snowball by Bridget Brophy and Free by Leah Epi. That episode will be out in a few weeks' time, so you've got time to read along with us if you like. This episode of the Book Club Review was edited and produced by me, Kate Slotover. If you want to support us, we'll soon be letting you know all the details of our new Patreon feed, where for a small monthly amount, we'll bring you extra episodes and book recommendations. We're also, for the first time, going to have a bit of advertising on the show, so if you want to avoid those, you'll find that option through Patreon. Whenever you listen to this episode, if you have thoughts on it, we'd love to hear them. Comment anytime on the episode page on our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk, where you'll also find full show notes, book recommendations and a transcript comments there go straight to our inboxes so do drop us a line we'd love to hear from you you can also sign up for our bi-weekly ish newsletter for extra reviews and recommendations if you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes follow us on instagram or facebook at book club review podcast on twitter at book club rvw pod or get in touch at the book club review at gmail.com and if you're not already why not subscribe to us on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts if you like what we do, one of the easiest ways to support us is to take a moment to rate and review the show, which helps other listeners find us. But for now, thanks for listening and happy book clubbing. <laughs>